Okay, so on to defending customer data because the world is full of evil forces. Uh, you have to worry even as an app developer about things that others would do to attack the app. And there's a, a number of cases we address at some level in the book. We're going to focus on three in this segment. Um, but the main thing that is important for you guys to remember as developers is what are the things that developers still have to be responsible for versus what kinds of attacks and defenses against them really are uh, on the part of the infrastructure provider. So if you're using platform as a service, one of the things you're theoretically paying for is for somebody else to handle best practices around securing the parts of the stack that are outside of your control. That's part of the, the goal of outsourcing that. So what is it that you as developers still have to worry about in terms of trying to secure the apps? And we'll start with probably one of the, the most misunderstood things, SSL, secure sockets layer, which is basically a way to encrypt traffic between a user's browser and your app to foil eavesdroppers, as simple as that. The problem that you have to solve in order to do this is that in order to create what's called a secure channel, meaning a channel that only you and the other party are able to understand the communications, is that you and the other party first have to share a secret. And of course, on the web, that's very difficult because the first time you visit a site you've never visited there before, there's no piece of common information you could use as the basis of the shared secret, which is why Rives, Shamir, and Edelman won the Turing Award for a practical implementation of a scheme that could actually do this, public key crypto. So how does this work? Uh, each principle, that's, so you're a principle, the, the, browser's a, the browser's a principle, the server's a principle, but each principle in a key exchange uh, generates a key that contains two matched parts. There's a public part that everyone can know, and there's a private part which you keep secret. Doesn't matter which part's which, just pick one. And the important property is that given one part, you can't deduce the other part. And the other key property is that if you use one part to encrypt something, you have to use the other part to decrypt it. So there's a number of ways that you can use those properties cleverly. One of them is uh, if I have somebody's public key and I am able to successfully use it to decrypt a message, I can roughly assume that the, other, that the person who created the message is the holder of the private key. Now, I might also assume that they are very bad at keeping their private key actually private, and some evil person stole their private key and is forging messages as them. But under the simplifying assumption that the private key is truly kept private, you could use this uh, basically to authenticate who wrote a message. And conversely, if I want to send a message that only the, recipient, the intended recipient can read, I use their public key part to encrypt it. When they receive it, they can use their private key part to decrypt it. And anybody else who gets their hands on it, it's useless. Again, unless somebody has managed to compromise and get a copy of the private key. So that's the simplified version of public key crypto. How it works in practice is if I'm rottenpotatoes.com or something, I go and prove my identity in some manner to a certificate authority. Uh, this is an entity, like there's millions about them uh, on the web. And the idea is that I am proving that I'm bona fide the operator of some website. I would like an SSL certificate that proves that fact. So once they uh, have seen whatever documentation they asked me to provide, they will use their private key to essentially sign a certificate to the effect that says, yes, this is domain name bob.com, this is what this site is. And I install that certificate signed by them on my server. Now when somebody visits my site bob.com, um, I return that certificate to whichever user visits me, and the certificate authorities have their public keys built into, essentially built into every browser. So the browser has enough built-in information to say, aha, I can determine which CA signed the certificate, and the certificate indeed vouches that Armando is the holder of the bob.com domain, and the domain is attached to the server. I know that bob.com is not masquerading as anybody. The server is who it claims to be. Um, so this, is, this general process is the beginning of what's called Diffie-Hellman key exchange. And once we've gotten to that point, we can essentially bootstrap ourselves an encrypted channel. It turns out that doing the public and private key encryption is actually fairly expensive. For most communications, once you've established trust, you use this process to establish a third key, which is used in symmetric crypto, which is much cheaper to do. And you can change out the key several times during a session. So with some simplification, this is roughly what SSL does. Um, and it's very easy to turn it on in Rails. Once you've got your uh, SSL certificate, you just say force SSL in any controller. That's it. If you say it in application controller, then every action in every controller is required to be SSL. And if a user tries to contact the site not using SSL, they'll automatically get redirected to the SSL version of that same URL. Uh, or you can selectively say only these actions or only these controllers have to use it. So if you've got controllers that manipulate more sensitive information, for example. So what does it do and what does it not do? What, what can you actually count on? Uh, well, certainly uh, it assures the browser that the site is legitimate. The site that is responding as bob.com really is bob.com, not, not an imposter. Um, and once you've bootstrapped the secure connection, any communication sent over that secure channel 
to a first order is impervious to eavesdroppers, so you get privacy. Um, it creates additional work for the server because there's extra computation involved in doing this key exchange step every time somebody contacts you over SSL. So it is more resource intensive to operate a site with SSL than without it, other things being equal. However, even in that case, that's all it does. It doesn't assure the server of who you are. That's separate, right? This is why the standard pattern for most servers is there's a login page served via SSL where you type a password. So you're still required to have a separate password to prove who you are, but the password is transmitted over a secure channel so eavesdroppers can't get at it. It also says nothing about what happens to data after it gets to the server. So if the server has used SSL to secure the connection, but they've left their database wide open to external browsers, all bets are off, right? It only protects the data while it's in transit. It also doesn't say anything about what other attacks the server might be vulnerable to. So there's many ways for an evil party to get access to your data. One way is to try to attack SSL. That's pretty hard to do. A better way is to see whether there's other attacks that could be mounted against the site after your data has already been stored there. We're going to look at some of those next. And lastly, if the server really is evil, by, there's nothing preventing an evil server from getting a certificate, right? Or a good server from getting a certificate and subsequently being infected as a distributor of evil code. So there's nothing about SSL that assures you of that. You could be securely served malware that will get installed on your computer, right? So SSL is a great technology. It's easy to turn it on and off, but it's important to remember the limitations of what it does and doesn't do. So if you're an attacker and you've decided you're not going to go after SSL because that's too hard, what else could you do? Well, you could inject SQL. Um, this is one of the most common attacks. It's so common that it's now officially embarrassing if this happens to your site, because it's widely known, it's been used in very high profile cases, and it's trivial to guard against. Um, here's the reason that we tell you not to put queries like uh, name equals and then a hard-coded string that came from the user, right? Where does params come from? It comes from getting data from a user-submitted web page, which, as we all know, is always untrustworthy. So, what happened if the evil user filled in this string as the value of their name? Unless you've got other safeguards in place, this is the SQL statement that is going to result from doing that where. You can see that it has the disastrous result of doing a trivial query, then destroying the table, and then having a comment character after it to make sure that anything after that point is ignored so the evil person has done their work. Um, there's a lovely XKCD comic here uh, that, that plays on this, by the way. Um, the solution, as we know, we've introduced it before. It's really simple. Use these mechanisms where there's uh, escape substitution for the parameters. Rails has plenty of stuff built in to sanitize the query parameters for you to avoid this kind of attack. This is officially embarrassing. This is the kind of thing that if we, not that we're going to do this, if we chose to try SQL injection on your app and it worked, you get a lot of points off. <laughs> it's, it's got me thinking we actually should try to do it, but we won't. Cross-site request forgery is a little more sophisticated. Here's how this one works. Alice, in all goodwill, logs into her bank site. That means her web browser now has a cookie for the bank site. Right? That means that any time her web browser makes a, another request from the bank site, that cookie is going to be included with a request. I'm an evil attacker, and I have managed to convince Alice to go to my evil site. And on my site, I have something like this. I'm simplifying for the purposes of example, but I have a tag that looks innocuous. It's going to be an image, but where is the image served from? It's served from Alice's bank, which means that when the remote transaction happens as a result of loading the page, the correct cookie is going to be included along with it. And what I'd really do is I'd put some JavaScript in here to try then harvest her personal info by making a request that includes a cookie that looks just like a valid session cookie, because it is a valid session cookie. So how do you thwart this? Again, it turns out to be pretty simple to do. What people used to do is they would check the referrer field, which is an HTTP header. It says, when you got to this site, where were you following a link from? And unless the answer was that you were following a link from the same site, bank.com, that would mean that it's an attacker. Of course, we all know that this is stupid because attackers can forge the headers any way they want. So what you should really do is include something called a nonce, which is a token that is generated, used once, and thrown away. So how does this work? There's a directive that you can put into your views. Most people just put it into your application layout template um, called CSERF meta tags, cross-site request forgery. What this causes to happen is anytime you have a form on any page, there's an additional hidden field on that form that includes essentially a random string that is never reused for the same session. So along with whatever regular values the user is trying to submit on the form, they also have to submit a hidden value that matches the nonce for that session. Otherwise, Rails itself will automatically reject the submission as being a cross-site request forgery. Right? So you don't actually have to do anything except put in CSERF meta tags in one of your views. Ideally, put it in the template that all of the other views use. And in your application controller, just say protect from forgery. That's pretty much it. 
right? So now, if somebody tries to submit a form and it's missing um, the matching random string that was included when that page was generated and served to the user, now the request will fail. Um, and if you guys remember, uh, a few sessions ago, I showed you uh, some code that I had to write to scrape a really badly designed website. The, one of the things that I had to do in scraping that code is I essentially had to do this. Right? I had to start from the actual front page of that site and then look at the form that the site was generating and submit exactly that. If I tried to just do a raw form submission, it would fail because every time you visit the site, it serves up a new random string, and that string has to be included every time I submit the form. That's how it knows that the submission is fresh, that the submission is associated with this session for this particular user. So again, not something you want to have happen in your apps, especially given that including two lines of code, uh, which by the way, if you generate a brand new Rails app, these are generally included by default. So you have to actually go out of your way to turn off this protection. So again, don't lose points on this, please. So question about SSL. If a site has a valid cert from a trusted CA, and why do I say a trusted certificate authority? Because there's numerous examples of a certificate authority, someone who gives out certificates, having their private keys compromised, which means that now the attacker can pretend to sign certificates that look perfectly valid, but they're fake. Uh, this actually happened to the CIA and Mossad a few years ago. It was extremely embarrassing. Um, that certificate authority is now out of business. But assuming it's a good certificate authority that hasn't had this problem, which can you assume is true if the site has a valid SSL cert, that it's not masquerading as an imposter, that it, uh, the attacks that I just described, like CSERF and SQL injection, will be more difficult to mount, or that your data is secure once it reaches the site? Which combination of these can be assumed to apply? <laughs> 